this is something, I'm going to tell you my source. Okay, my source here is a, is a uh, British company called Ford. And they're going to be hitting the market here in the United States hot and heavy with advertising and everything. Um, but this, these are their contraindications. So everybody, you got to have a contraindication of some kind, right? right. right. So, and every single one of these other doctors will say, ah, blah, 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 except for one. And that's irradiation of the eyes. Okay? When you're at a, a high uh, intensity laser, like a class 3B laser, then you're, uh, you've got put, uh, potential uh, harm right directly to the retina. So are we at class 3B? We're though? not. We are not. And I'll go through the classes of lasers in just a second, okay? So you want the safety goggles for the patients. If you want to be extras, and your patients are going to tell you, that's going to hurt me, even this little thing. And you can spend all the time you want explaining it to them, or you can say, okay, what I'm going to do is, it's a bright light, so just like when you're in the sun, you don't want to look directly at a bright light, close your eyes, I'm going to put a little towel over your eyes, and then you don't have to worry, okay? If you've got, um, if, with this particular laser, okay, I'm talking about this particular laser. Otherwise, you read your manufacturer's, I don't know what you've got in your clinic, you read your manufacturer's information and you do as they say. Hemorrhage. It's conceivable that laser-mediated vasodilation, get this, vasodilation with lasers, vasodilate, worsens the hemorrhage. Uh, I have a cut and I'll show you the scar. I sat in the emergency room for three hours waiting for them to deal with it. It was right down to the tendon, almost lost use of my thumb. I said, I can't do this anymore. I took out my laser because it goes everywhere in my purse with me. This was a number of years back when I knew they would think I was nuts. And I sat there and I did my little tiny, very weak laser on that. By the time the doctor got to me, he looked at me. He said, oh my god, you're an incredible uh, fast healer. Look at you. It was not flowing. It was clotting. It was coming up as blood clots. But that was after quite some time using this, OK? <laughs> so, uh, and it's because this was so weak. So that's controversial, too. You know, it depends on the time to place the, the unit that you're working with, the part of the body, the patient's history, what's going on with them, with uh, their overall general bleeding phenomenon there. Yeah, can I ask you two things? Sure. The thing about the eyes, if the person closes their eyes, you go over the eyes, are you okay with that? Well, <laughs> doctor, I'm standing here and I'm going to tell you that they say laser therapy will impact the eyes. Therefore, if a patient reads that and you have irradiated their eyes, what do you think is going to happen? It will put you at risk for a lawsuit. Sure. Pay attention, because this is a very litigious uh, culture. It's going to put you at risk for a lawsuit. Well, here's, here's so let's just talk practicality. So this is my wife and I work on each other. Yeah. And the sinus involved. So we're working on the sinuses. We'll have to close our eyes during that time. So obviously you want to get close to the areas where the eyes are. Reality. Right. So you're accepting across at the membrane in the eye, right. with the closed membrane. Right. So I, I found that to be the case. Now, have you found that to be, to, you know, have you lost any adverse effects? Yeah. Okay, I said this over here. You all heard me say it. We did. Now let me tell you what's happened in my practice and where that research originally came from. They took a little monkey, strapped him down, and pointed a laser into his eyes for hours. That poor thing. And that's where they came up with this information. It, when people at the conference in Hilo talked about this, another big explosion between the scientists. There's one doctor over here saying, oh no, you can't irradiate the eyes. And Lars from Sweden and all the Europeans are saying, it's safe, don't worry about it. We have never had, and he hasn't published, one single incident of light damage related to eyes, except for the circumstance where a clinician, when they put their glasses on, he scratched his eye yeah. with the glasses. Terrible. Terrible. It wasn't the laser that hurt his eye. I actually have used the laser to, uh, to heal a cornea. I didn't come directly. I came juxtaposed the with, eye with the beam. It helped tremendously. It helped immediately. Yeah. Okay? Um, but you didn't hear me say that. Now it's on tape. And you didn't hear me say that either. Yeah. I was watching the tape. <laughs> Second question. Yeah. A lot of things you're talking about here, we see a, a, your PowerPoint. Do you have those on paper? Mm -hmm. um, I have some of this in depth, much more <coughs> for you uh, in, in, in what you have. <coughs> um, in the contra and if you want, I can I'll print this all out for anybody who wants an exact copy of the PowerPoint. Uh, so, pregnancy. So what yeah. you're saying, I just wanted to get that. What you're saying is put some glasses on them, 
so you don't get involved in a lawsuit. It's not going to hurt them, right. but because of, uh, you might get that one in a million. Right. If you're not using glasses, we're talking about 3B laser, class 3B laser, okay? And when we go through the class of laser, you'll see the, the more explanation of it. But um, this, this type of laser is approved by the FDA. It's, not, it's, it's out there in the public. You know you're not going to be damaging the retina with this, okay? So it's a different, uh, again, of how it's classed. And I'll explain that in just a second. Let me get through these. Again, we talked about carcinoma. Again, the controversy with carcinoma. So and rather than contraindications, Dr. Mary Dyson suggested that as laser clinicians, uh, she's a, a wonderful uh, physician who's been in the field a long time doing research on, in England. Um, she suggested that rather than use this powerful term contraindication, uh, that we use uh, suggestions of precaution, okay? Which leaves it up to the circumstance of the patient. The <coughs> Again, thyroid, huge issue with thyroid. Do we irradiate directly over the thyroid? I will, because it's brought up here, I will teach you how to work with the thyroid but not directly, okay? Um, and again, there's Russian research that I have here. I can show you where they're using it to treat Hashimoto's disease. Oh. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Immune-suppressing drugs, they're suggesting you not use it with that. Over the sympathetic ganglia, such as the vagus nerves, carotid region, in patients with heart disease and pacemakers and all that kind of stuff, because it significantly alters neural function. It's a contraindication in these regions with heart disease. However, we know that laser therapy impacts atherosclerosis profoundly. So, there you go. Puncture wounds. Now, I've had experience with puncture wounds. Listen to this. Nobody else is going to tell you this. It's not anywhere in the literature. I'm telling you from experience, okay? Puncture wounds are dicey. Puncture, when you're talking wound healing, puncture wounds are dicey. In fact, I just had a circumstance of a newborn baby who's, the family has a wolf and the baby was swinging and, and it's new to the household and so the wolf was introducing herself and the swing came forward, the dog did not bite her, the wolf did not bite her, the swing came forward and the tooth got in and broke the skin. This is a new mother, she's freaking. She went to the medical doctor and the medical doctor said, I've never had a kid this age with this kind of a thing. He didn't know what to do with it. And um, I have not seen the child. They called me up on the phone. What kind of a situation am I in here, guys? Dicey. Yeah. Dicey. I haven't examined the patient. What can I say? Well, the medical doctor examined the patient, therefore, whatever the medical doctor says. But when you can, bring the child in. But uh, with a puncture wound, and I've taught uh, most of my patients laser therapy, by the way. Okay, I've educated almost every single one of my patients on laser therapy. And they know about home care and they do it. Because the guy prescribed it for me. Um, but with puncture wounds, the problem is, is that if you heal the surface of a puncture wound, what are you doing? Okay. You, you, you're closing it and it can't drain. Yeah. You, and how, puncture wounds are dicey. So uh, I'm going to suggest to you that you not do, uh, particularly uh, the red level laser on a puncture wound. Okay, uh, stitches, uh, laser therapy with stitches. Don't do it over stitches, guys. They're gonna hate you. They're gonna hate you when they have to pick those things out because you instantly heal that stitch into the wound. And boy, that's not fun. <laughs> okay, once they get the stitches out, you can go like gangbusters and take away the scar. You close it completely and take away the scar. We'll talk about scars later. Okay, laser light acts on a cellular level. Enzymes are photoreceptors. We're going to talk specifically about these photoreceptors. It's real important for you to understand them because you need to know, as a laser specialist, how a laser works, okay? So laser light in interacts with these chromophores. It's called a chromophore. Porphyrin, it's like chlorophyll, okay, is one of these in, in this category, okay? Porphyrin, photo, uh, ph photosensitivity of the plants, right? Photosynthesis. B12 is a porphyrin. Then it helps promote growth, nerve damage, treats anemia. It's found only in meat products. Your vegetarians are in trouble for B12. But if you stimulate the body and it's got a good source of B12, guess what? The laser therapy is going to be more effective. Cytochrome P450. Cytochrome P450 is the body's most powerful detox enzyme family. You get patients in there toxic. This is what's going on with them. 
they're inhibited by serotonin reuptake, antidepressants, and acids. One fifth of all the medications that they're taking will hit, inhibit cytochrome P450. This is a chromophore. Interference with it leads to, and that's a 450, not 44450. I'm sorry, that's a typo. It interferes and gives you multiple chemical sensitivities, environmental illness, and related illnesses. Anemia. That's related to heme synthesis, P450. Okay? All kinds of drugs will impact laser therapy. The detox pathways will be blocked. You'll see behavior changes. You're going to see these uh, attention deficit kids bouncing off the walls. You're going to see cognitive problems developing. Have you ever noticed that with a chronically ill patient? They're gorked. They can't even keep their appointment time straight. you got to call them to remind them. The cognitive function is one of the first things you're going you're gonna to see go, and I'm going to show you how to find it before it becomes critical. Okay? I'm going to show you how to find it and how to deal with it so that you know where your patient is at before it becomes critical. B2 is a cofactor uh, for flav uh, flavoproteins here. It's water-soluble, and that's what makes the urine yellow. Okay? The flavoproteins catalase oxidation. Okay, that's respiration of the cells. It impacts DNA. We're genetic clinicians using laser therapy. We're actually impacting the DNA and the RNA. And it's a transformer. We're creating transformers so that we can take chemical information, from photochemical information, into chemical information. That's how lasers work. <coughs> you take energy, you feed the body photon <coughs> energy, and it becomes chemical information, and from there it all happens. Okay, it's cofactor, water soluble, promotes the breakdown of fats. You want to lose weight? B2 synthesizes the steroids, red blood cells, glycogen, there's your sugar handling. Deficiencies, you get inflammation of the tongue, photophobia, dizziness, insomnia, you have the slow learners and migraines respond to them. Let's talk now about. Remember, I did say that there, although a laser is referred to, look, it's cold laser, put it on your hand. Look, you're not going to feel it. It's not burning. looks like it should. If you hold there long enough, people will say, I'm starting to feel that. And you ask them, what does it feel like? A little bit warm or uh, tingly or, or uh, I just kind of feel it. It feels like energy or something, okay? Because it starts that microcirculation going, and you get a heat response in the tissues. This cannot start a forest fire. Okay. Although they do want, or the, at least Reagan's administration talked about developing a laser that would be strong enough that we could vaporize any missiles coming towards us. Uh, what they neglected to say was that to fire that type of laser once would close down the entire eastern seaboard and take out the Niagara Falls power plant because it would take that much energy to fire. Okay. So heat shock, protein, and stress. These proteins protect the body from the negative effect of stressors. They're adaptogens, stressor adaptogens. It's pre they're present, every, every cell has them. You increase that and you protect against the harmful agents in the body. What they're finding is repeated small shocks of heat to the body is more effective than just one single shock. How frequently do you want to treat a patient? Repeated small shocks to the body more effective than one single shock. You've you got to follow through. you got to get them in there, okay? And each session will be incrementally more powerful than the next. Unlike a sauna or fever therapy, um, and uh, Dr. Sade is going to be here, and I know they do infrared sauna, so please, when she comes this afternoon, discuss this with her. Uh, laser therapy using wavelength and heat can be directed to the area most needed. You can be specific. <coughs> you can be specific. Okay, lasers are classified, here we go. They're classified based on the potential for causing biological damage, not on wavelength or frequency. Okay? The biologic, the issues with how it's going to hurt the eyes. That's the basic thing they're based on. When you see a laser, it should be labeled one of four classes. Here we go. Now you do have this in your stuff. Um, class one, this is a class one laser. Okay? Pen lights. It's not going to have any known hazardous levels. Uh, 1A, that's what they're using in the supermarkets. Okay? Well, it's not intended for viewing, but it's not dangerous. 2, 
low power visible lasers emitted above that, but radiant power not above a one milliwatt. Okay? Human aversion will just make you blink and turn away. That's the concept of class two lasers. They're not going to hurt you. 3A and 3B. These are intermediate power lasers. We're seeing them now. They're the more common <coughs> lasers that are starting to come out, more powerful lasers. And they're hazardous for interbeam viewing. They're a one to a five milliwatt laser. Well, guess what? This is a five milliwatt laser. It doesn't hurt your eyes. It's about the power behind it. This has a um, very small batteries behind it. 3B, these are moderate power lasers. And again, this is a class that you, you will be seeing. Uh, they'll be talking about, I don't know, is there Konya 3B? I don't know where they are, David, with that. But, um, you know, I don't know either. Yeah, I think it's a class 2 or a class 3. Yeah, they're, they're start, I think Arconia is actually probably more of a class 2. But they're coming out with uh, class 3B lasers now. And you'll, you'll see that. Those, you do want to have your glasses for your patients. Class 4. These are your high power lasers, 500 milliwatt lasers, and they're pulsed, uh, they're hazardous, uh, they're potential fire hazards, they're a skin hazard, and guess what? We, we don't do that. We don't go there. We don't. That's not what we do in our practices. Well, like surgery. Okay. And in class four, you got to have some major, uh, major uh, protective things in place to use a class four laser. Okay. Okay, there's a lot of discussions about uh, the best way to quantify dosage. There's no agreed method upon defining beam area. The dosage is expressed, you'll see in the literature, joules per centimeter. Okay, uh, and there's an example, 30 milliwatt will give you, use for 20 seconds will give you 40 joules. This is a huge issue. This is a huge issue in the field among uh, the research scientists. And as practitioners, oh, we're very lucky because a lot of the the uh, fellows who are designing our units have it all programmed in for us, and that's great. Okay, laser therapy and the clinical practice and scientific background. This is uh, Lars's book, and he talks about all of these issues in depth. If you really want all the deep stuff there, well, Lars from the Swedish Medical Society can help you with that. And we're going to talk about the pre and the post test, but uh, first I want to kind of, David, I need your help on this. Um, I want to jump to the chase. Could you help me? I need to switch something. I'm not sure how to get out of this program. And I'll show you some of the things that, that uh, Lars uh, presents in his book real quick. He's given me permission uh, to use this information. It's, I think it will be helpful for you to think about it, um, not just in clinical application, but to really kind of lock in some of these concepts that I just went over. Uh, therapy localizing, that's about muscle testing. You want to we're going, to, we're going to show you how to get into the viscera and work with acupuncture points, of course. Uh, range of motion test, that's a pretest you're going to do. Orthopedic exam, neurological exam, all those things you're going to do on your patients. Okay? The problem is, is before I had laser therapy, I would get these positive neurological signs and orthopedic signs, and half the time they didn't mean anything to me. Because I just I went about doing my chiropractic and, and that was fine, but you know what? Now there's more insight. I can take this cerebellar test and I can give you some insight into how to use that test in a very different way of clinically. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, you do a visual exam of the, of the person, and one of the things that you're going to visualize in this class is the uvula and the position of the uvula, because it's going to tell you the condition of the vagus nerve, the cranial nerve. Not only that. You're going to look at that, and if it's out of position, you're going to fix it immediately. And when you fix it immediately, you're going to turn that vagus nerve on, upper cervical people. I'm going to show you how to adjust through the mouth. Yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> and of course, you want your history. You want your history, and you want to do whatever other exams you do on your patient. That's fine. Now, assessing the cranial rhythmic impulse. How many people know how to palpate cranial rhythm? You're going to be our experts, you know, be working with everybody else, and we're going to teach you how to do the cranial rhythm because it's going to help you with dosing, okay? Okay, pain management. This is, should be in your book. We're going to talk about, at length, in, in your handout, the stellate ganglion. I'm going to show you how to access the cranial nerves, how to deal with the cranial sutures. If you got pain, you go to the point of pain with a laser. Take it away, boom, like that. Uh, you want to go to the spinal level. If you have something in the peripheral, 
area, listen to this, doctors. If you have a peripheral lesion, carpal tunnel, elbow, shoulder, guess what's going to happen? What the research shows is that if you irradiate this area, it's going to go back to the spine and resolve the spine. It's going to stimulate the, uh, the nerve root. Isn't that cool? So let's go to the nerve root and stimulate the peripheral nerves, too. All right, we can do it both ways. That's the coolest thing. I was so excited when I saw that in the research. OK, uh, dermatomes. You can use the dermatomes. What are the dermatomes about? Cutaneous innervation. Cutaneous innervation. We're using something that affects the skin. So let's go to a dermatome. Let's hit the dermatome, and, hit, and that will heal the spine. With the laser, you can't do that with your hands, technically. You don't have anything you can do with your hands that'll, that'll take that away. That dermatome is going to keep firing. You can turn it off and stimulate the root that it came from. Trigger point and acupuncture point, uh, foot reflexology, Chapman's reflexes. This is the coolest thing. Very complicated. I'm going to show you shortcuts. You're going to love Chapman's reflexes when you're finished with this class. Uh, you'll have to set aside time to integrate it into your class, but I'll show you lots of shortcuts. He's a, this is neurolymphatic drainage real fast with laser therapy. Okay, radiating the stellate ganglion. This is pain control. Uh, pilot studies show that you can significantly impact the circulation to the brain by irradiating the stellate ganglion. In a second, I'll teach you how to do that, okay? Real important for your pain patients. Arthritis. Point and shoot. Go right to it. Okay, I, we're doing really cool things with arthritis and even rheumatoid arthritis and because it affects the median nerve in the hands and the carpal tunnel issues. Postmasectomy of <coughs> lymphedema. Oh, it's terrible stuff. Lymphedema in general is terrible stuff. Wow, you got something really cool when you put an infrared laser on lymphedema and you combine that with a, uh, with a very good uh, lymphatic drainage program which we'll, we'll be teaching in another seminar. After six weeks of laser therapy, there was reduced volume. This is the Australians now. They were just so excited about this stuff. Uh, there's reduced volume, but look at this. Think about what I'm saying in this next part of the sentence. In both the affected arm and the unaffected arm. Oh my God. You mean if I shine it anywhere in the body and I make a mistake, it's still gonna help? You bet. There's no mistake, except maybe I didn't put it in the best place. It's still going to help. You're feeding the body. You're feeding the body. Energy. Photon energy. Okay. Um, systemic effects. Endogenous opiates are created when you hit the trigger points. A literature review on human locomotive system. Okay, guess what? They took every single piece of research they could find that talked about neuromusculoskeletal stuff. Lasers in the red or infrared are beneficial. And that includes nerve regeneration, muscle tendon repair, reduction in tissue inflammation. We're chiropractors. We love this. It's phenomenal. It's going to revolutionize our profession. Laser therapy affects living tissue locally at the site and at the time of irradiation through these pathways. Think about it. Generates ATP. ATP is energy. Every cell needs it. We're going to give the body energy. Dr. Uh, Regal's research from uh, Barcelona, Josefa Regal, just did uh, research using ATP. She irradiated it. She found that it extended the chemical uh, influence of ATP 10 times longer than non-irradiated ATP. So not only are you going to stimulate the formation of it, you're going to juice it so it lasts longer for that patient. You think a debilitated patient can use that? ATP is very important for your patients with chronic but no. Polarization of the uh, brain lipid stuff, so here you go with permeability. Influences oxygen, free radicals, detoxifies. Detoxifies. Remember the pathways that I showed you with the chromophores? Detoxifies. There's a porphyria. Oops. Redu reduces the pain transmission. Systemic influence on the opiates. We talked about that. Axoplasmic flow within the neurons. Turn on the light. Remember they talked about that, you know? Chiropractic? Yeah. Influences permeability of the fascia. All you guys are doing body work. Fascia. Woo! Does it respond? It's so wonderful. 
It takes a cranial sacral session and cuts it in 10 minutes if you want, okay? And it helps with the passage of uh, debris and hematoma. Hi. Hi. Grab a chair. Thanks. Okay, so bruises. You can take the bruise and fade it like that. Bruises respond real well. And patients love that. We're going to see an 85-year-old patient with a terrible black eye uh, on Sunday. She's coming in. She had a bad, bad fall, so we'll be working with her. Systemic effects by changes in modulation of the plasma, circulating blood. Blood is a huge issue with the Russians. They're doing tremendous things by looking at blood, irradiating blood, and they're doing it in a way that we can't in this country because in Russia they can take the blood, irradiate it with laser, put it back in the body, and wow, they're seeing incredible things. Do you remember the controversy in the 80s with AIDS patients where a fellow was trying to do that in this country with uh, UV light? They did UV light stuff back in the 30s and they were curing sepsis. Uh, so, you know, this isn't a new concept. I'm going to show you, because we're chiropractors, we don't draw blood, we don't want to deal with blood, nobody here deals with blood. I'll show you how to do this with saliva. Okay? We can do saliva. Uh, it's non-formal in nature, it impacts the tissues, heat shock response, okay? Sports physicians, um, this is what they found, they were looking at what do drugs do, we already talked about this, but here's some specific drugs that will slow your laser therapy up. Okay, the steroids, the calcium channel blockers, cardiological <coughs> medications, um, and it depends on how much they're taking and how toxic their body is as to the effect, okay? Chemicals that are positive agents are biostimulative, okay? Pheno, uh, plenosol, that's photoreceptive at 660 nanometers, and uh, ferrum and copper, that's iron. But what they're doing here is they're injecting it. We can't inject. I'm going to teach you uh, laser photophoresis so you can do it topically, okay, guys? I'm in the process of working with Newton Laboratories. They're an absolutely wonderful homeopathic uh, laboratory. And um, what we're going to be doing with that is uh, we're going to create a special cream that will enhance your laser therapy profoundly because we're going to take these principles and apply it to that homeopathic cream. We should have that in the next month. Uh, procaine, they found if you inject it, it's a nice anesthetic, but it also kind of taxis the impact of the photo stuff. So um, you want to get the joints when you're getting in a joint. You want to use your positioning. That will improve your results. Uh, when you're thinking about where you're shooting, here, take a look at the Achilles tendon. Look at that. That's, that's not very deep. It's kind of thick, but it's not very deep. We can get to the Achilles tendon. Doctor, you're an upper cervical specialist. What can we do about the atlas from the Achilles? We can move it. Right? SLT. SLT techniques. Pay close attention to that. All right? Forearm extensors, supraspinatus, patella. I'm going to show you with paralysis patient where all this stuff is, you know, you, you can do tremendous changes with it. Uh, you want to use it as soon as, as you can. All right? And as you get going through an acute thing, you can cut back on a number of sessions, okay? You can do osteoarthritis twice weekly or more if you need to, depending on what's going on. Okay, now this is the photophoresis uh, that I was talking about. Um, right now, in a few minutes, we'll take a break. Penny's here, and we have a patch that is very, very good to help with weight loss. I'm not going to discuss the product very much. What I'm going to tell you is if you use the concept of photo laser photophoresis, and you're applying, because a lot of people have to apply those pain patches, for example, that they apply through the skin now. And you teach them to clean it real good. You don't want to trap bacteria. If you trap bacteria, what you're going to get is a dermal reaction. And then they'll say, oh, I got sick from this, or this gave me a rash, or I'm allergic to it, okay? Make sure they wash it before they put a patch on of any kind. And then you put it on, and then those herbs get absorbed into the body. And that's a particularly good uh, product to help your patients. I've never seen anything work as good uh, as this particular product for weight loss. We have patients who come in, I just want to drop 10 pounds and boom, it's off. So it works real well. I use it for other things as well, but uh, we'll talk about that on a break at some point if you're interested in, the, in it. But I, I do want you to go ahead and, and uh, take a look at that as a, as a possible help. Okay, cerebellar test. Our oh, are we still then? on here? All right, good. Nobody's ever demonstrated this. I presented this information at, um, at 
many years ago now. I, I was one of the main speakers at a, a Nambudrapad Allergy Elimination Therapy Symposium. And uh, it was the first time that I presented it publicly. So this is the second time, guys. All right. Um, what this is, is the classic testing, uh, neurological test that you use for a cerebellum. Yeah. Let's see if the cerebellum is going to work. Let me show you. No, no, no. I got to talk to you. Yeah. No, you got to talk to me. No, no, you're going to stay right here. Mm -hmm. Right there. Now, there are three things that we're going to check. Cerebellum is about balance and a lot of other functions, okay? Uh, the first test that we're going to do is we're just going to see, and I'm going to need somebody behind me. Um, okay. Oh, are you going to catch her? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we got a doctor who's going to put her down. I'll catch her. Oh, okay. So, you always had to trust you already. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> um, what you need to know is if your patients, and I'm going to use a very scientific term, gorked, if your patients are gorked, then you'll know because you have their history, <coughs> okay, and you'll have absorbed them <coughs> before you do anything. Uh, you'll have a sense of whether or not you have to have uh, somebody behind them. And a lot of times they'll even surprise you because you won't expect this, but what, this is what you're going to look for. What I need you to do, and listen to how I say it, and what I need you to do is bring your feet together all the way because everybody wants to, if they're really compromised, they're not going to want to bring their feet together, guys, and they'll, and they'll do this. And then you have to repeat it. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Bring your feet together all the way, please. All right, good. Now, stand a little closer in case you need to catch them. No, no, not you. No, you yeah. can stay there. Okay, you got your feet together? Mm -hmm. Ian, uh, close your eyes, please, and stand with your eyes closed. And let them stand there for a few minutes. I'm going to get away from you. I'm like, whoa, got her? Where are you going? <laughs> Thank you. We needed you. We needed you. I do this with them next to my table, and I'll tell them, look, when you close your eyes, if you go off balance, remember, just grab the table. Take a step. You'll be okay. You won't fall. Uh, even so, we have had to catch a couple of patients, okay? This is no lightweight test, believe me. You get a patient up there, they'll get scared when that happens. They're going to be terrified. Oh my God, I got a brain tumor. What are you going to tell them? Don't worry, I can fix it. <laughs> Bring your hands straight out, okay? That's what you say, and you be casual about it because you can. Now, I want you walking like a zombie with this posture. Mm. Bring your hands right out. Don't bend your, mm. don't bend those guys. Keep it straight. Most of the time, you'll see this written up is uh, using the index finger. We're not going to do that. We're going to use the longest finger right here. This is the pass pointing test. We'll do it, and then I'll explain it. First, what you're going to do is keep your eyes closed again, so you know you've got to stay ready. I want you to take this tip of this finger right directly to the tip of your nose, and I want you to do it slowly. They will compensate like heck and go, even if you say slowly. But she's doing great. You rule. And she's going you backwards. You got to catch me, yeah. buddy. <laughs> see, see that after she's, you can go ahead and do it a little faster than that. Because we're going to fall asleep if you don't want to say Okay. I just, you, you just did it. Well, I did felt it, it first. Did you see where I, she went? Uh -huh. That's I went to the lip. lip. I went to the lip, and then I realized where I was, and I that's a positive. That's a positive. This is what it'll look like. They'll come, they'll bring it here, they'll bring it here, and, and you'll see them hesitate, and then all of a sudden they'll compensate and they'll cheat. And you'll catch it. Look for the cheating. <laughs> a lot of times they'll even do this. I've had people poke themselves in the eye. We're talking compromise of the cerebellum. Okay? Both hands. Let's see what the other lobe is going to tell us. You know, this lobe is shot. Which lobe is it? All right. Yes, thank you. Remember what the cord? That finger, please. Same one. Same thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I want to cheat, but I'll go where I'm going. Okay? <laughs> okay. So we've got we've got some problems. No, no, cerebellum, upper cervical, all kinds of stuff is going on in here. I have some tongue depressors. Um, okay, we're, we're going to follow up with the tad de moi. That's the third part of the cerebellum. Now I'm going to get some tongue depressors out and we're going to see if there's a compromise of the occiput, which is your cerebellum, or and the atlas and see what's going on. I'll show you how to test for that. But now what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to stand to the side in case we need you. You start over here, please. Way back here. Now, stay there. Now, this is the drunk driving test. 
This is scary because when they fail this test, they're going to say, oh my God, what if I get pulled over? Now you're going to say, don't worry, I have it documented. You're my patient. I'll take care of you. All right? You're going to cover it for them. Take the worry away because it is frightening to see this stuff happen because nobody's ever pointed this out. My God, it's their brain. Nobody showed them their brain's not working. Okay, one foot after the other, heel to the toe, and you're walking in a straight line. You've got nice dots on this. Yeah, see? Yeah, look at that. Okay. Now I'm getting that. Now we're on the trapeze. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why they do it with the trapeze. They'll hold a bar and it'll keep their balance, but that's what you had to do to compensate. There's your compensation. That's a positive. Okay. And you'll see all variations on the style, the courses, chiropractors, we know there might be a joint problem in there. There might be this or that. They might have different histories. Look at the overlay. We're looking for the overlay. Okay? SOT, when they do sacrocipital testing, they do that stuff. You know, they measure it, but they never bring the feet totally together to figure out what the sacroiliac is doing. Okay? They always keep the feet separated, and then they do the sway and the postural changes. This is a cerebellum test, the feet are together. It gives you different information than that. All right, now, now we want to know what's the source. We know that the cerebellum, occiput, cerebellum is occiput, okay, base of the skull. I'll bet you there's something going on with her atlas. Now we can therapy localize, which means muscle test. Who here is good at muscle testing? Okay, who isn't good at muscle testing? Okay, we got to figure out, we'll get you guys up to speed with muscle testing. Do you want to see the case? I think you and I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, so we're just going to therapy look like here. Stand right there. Is this a good position there? Yeah. Okay, bring this arm up and look straight ahead, not at me. That's important. If your patients have a rapport with you, or if you're wearing something that is the right color, or if you have a talisman on, you can impact your testing. So they gotta look away. You can keep that arm strong, home, and that's the simplest test in the world to do, and that's what I use all the time in my practice. So she's strong. See? Boop. I don't have to overpower her butt. Pull. Wah. We get a positive. There's something going on there. That's your therapy localization. That's your muscle testing. Okay? The way I do it is I tap them and then they lose it. And then I retest them with my other problem. Oh, okay. There's a lot of ways to work okay. with, with these concepts. Okay. But don't tap me in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> my pineal, man. <laughs> By the way, she just showed us where she needs to be treated. Mm -hmm. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. She showed us where she needs to be treated. It wasn't here. There's a part, the pineal. She's not sleeping at night. So she has her circadian rhythm is shot. But she went to me and did that very, and it's very intuitive. People will do that to you. They'll show you exactly what they need. The other thing they'll do is they're all, they'll automatically grab what they need when they get hurt. You know, that's a basic thing. Oh, my God, I'm hurt. I, you know, you know, the first thing you do is put your other hand on it or whatever. Um, let's think now. We, we know there's something going on there. What other clinical exam can we do? Now, we know this area involves the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the queen of the parasympathetic system. It is the most powerful nerve that you could ever stimulate. Upper cervical people know this. You ask a chiropractor, I don't care what school they graduate from, and you put them in this situation and you say to them, you got a patient, they're throwing up, they're having heart palpitations, they got bowel problems, um, they're dizzy, you're not digesting. I'm going to give you one bone to adjust. What are you going to move? Doctor? Well, it'd be the atlas. That's it. The atlas. The atlas. That's why doctors who specialize in upper cervical work are so successful. Because they're treating and releasing the queen of the parasympathetic system. How do we find it? We found it on her with muscle testing. I'm going to have you sit. We need a chair up here. And can you say, ah? Uh, uh. Oh, she's saying, ah, uh, but you know what? Her tongue's in the way. Sorry. I can use a tongue depressor. <clears throat> don't you hate them? You don't want to use a tongue depressor on your own self, let alone a patient. Why? Because they're going to cause a... Okay. 
Gag. Gag. Gag reflex. What cranial nerve? Cranial nerve. <laughs> Nine. Glossopharyngeal. Okay. Okay. Say ah. Uh. No gag reflex. Whoop. Cranial nerve. Ten. Cranial nerve. Nine. Okay. Open more. Let's see if we can get your tongue out of the way. Say ah. Uh. Can't do it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring, I'm going to start my laser therapy session right now so that I can perform this test properly. And where's my little laser here? I got to get the tongue out of the way. I got to get the tongue out of the way. Now I've got to stimulate the hypoglossal nerve, which is cranial nerve. Yeah. Now we got we, we to gotta get the hypoglossal nerve. It's cranial nerve 12, I think. Isn't it? Let me see. The parasympathetic system is three ocular motor, six, uh, I think six is glossopharyngeal, nine, and ten. So, here, here we go. Superficial cutaneous nerve to relax the tongue. Okay? I'm going to teach you how to fix a paralyzed tongue to help children speak without cutting the frenulum. If the frenulum needs to be cut, that might have to happen. This is how to affect. Your head and your patients can't talk. You can clear up that speech like that. Right here, from this area, the ramus of the jaw, now you tell me if this relaxes you. Um, what you'll get is there's a superficial aspect of, of the cranial nerve that impacts the tongue. It's right in here. Tell me if you're. It's rather weird because it's starting to freeze me right around. I hit the nerve. So that's not the pterygoid? That, it's no. just, the just in front of the pterygoid. Yeah. Okay. And if you're on the pterygoid, it'll make them salivate. Mm -hmm. So if you come to the other side, pardon me. If you come to the other side, and you'll feel, and then the tongue will just melt and get out of the way. Mm -hmm. So the relaxation. And she's already in a parasympathetic state. Do you see it? <laughs> just kind of right down. Now, if you open your mouth, I can get in there without a tongue depressor. <laughs> I didn't change the thickness of that tongue. <clears throat> no. I relaxed the muscle. And you also, I just had um, a cat, uh, not a cat, but a tooth fixed about three weeks ago, and now I'm, I'm feeling much better. Thank you. And so she had all kinds of head and neck problems from dental stuff. So we reinforce that. Just go to that area with the laser real quick. And we'll reinforce that. And when you get real good, you won't even bother to do the pressure because you'll know we got to go in there, and the laser alone will relax that tongue because I'm hitting the nerve itself. Plus my ears. Cleared up my ears. What do you think it does for TMJ to go there? What a simple place to go to to do all those things. Now, now I want you all to examine her uvula. And the uvula is the part where, you know, it hangs down and then you see the palate. It comes down and there's a palate and you're looking for the tonsils. Do you mind? Oh, you're not saying that. Okay. All right. If you look closely, you'll see that it's caving in on the left side. Yeah. So if you want to examine this, go ahead and take a look real quick, guys. This is subtle. You'll see very dramatic cases of this where there's a complete deviation. So that you go on. Yes. Close your eyes, please. Open your mouth. Guess what I can do? I don't have to put gloves on. Get in there. But I can shine it in the back. Even if the tongue gets in the way, we're still hitting it and we're still resolving it. And it's working uh, on, on the palate. Well, I'm working on the area where it's caved in, because it's not symmetrical. Okay, it's not symmetrical. All right, so that's the beginning of it. Now, we'll do a close-up later. Can you stick your tongue no, straight I, out? I, I should have had you do this. Stick your tongue so straight. Uh, totally straight. <laughs> See the fasciculation of the tongue? Yeah. To so the back uh, here, to so the side here, please. Bring your tongue to the side, not your head. Uh, See the compensation? Uh, you see it? I'm going to turn my head because I can't move my tongue. Here. She's really in trouble. She's really compromised. And then upper cervical going on. Okay. So, and we're starting to change. We're starting to see the change. See My that? breath. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Parasympathetic system. Rest, repair, recuperate. She's starting to finally rest, repair, and recuperate because we're taking that stress off. What do I do? I shine the light on her. That was cool. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, guys. In an emergency, you can improvise. I had a doctor, I was down in Florida, he was in a terrible condition. And he said, nobody can move my atlas, nobody can help me. 
I just, nobody can do it. And it was almost a point of pride that nobody could fix it. I said, oh, I can fix that in a minute. Ah, I didn't have my laser. I said, all right, we'll lay down. Looked around the room. We were at his mom's place. And uh, they had a flashlight. They had a red umbrella. I shined it through the red umbrella. And I moved his atlas. <laughs> so that tells you about what the wavelength wavelength was very important in that particular incident. Would have been a heck, heck of a lot better if I'd had my little laser. And you don't need much to impact the nerves when you know where they are and you know where they come superficially. So you just did a heck of a lot of good here. Just by knowing how to look for it, how to find it, and then how to fix it, and then how to retest to make sure that you fixed it. Now, just out of curiosity, I'll, uh, uh, would you please stick your tongue straight out again, please? Still having problems with it. Now, you can get the bottom of the tongue. You lift your tongue up. I'm going to catch the bottom. So not your head. Mm -hmm. Good. So now we're at the bottom of the tongue. We're radiating the bottom of the tongue. It's another place of intervention for the hypoglossal nerve. Go to the other side. And that's a start for her, okay? She's got a lot of stuff going on. Good. All right. So, how's that for a test? Do you like that stuff? Yeah. You guys want to practice it? See what we can find and fix? All right, I'm going to let you, yeah. Are you going to post that for right now? Uh, well, we can. Let's see if it's changed anything. I think we're going to need more work because we didn't go uh, and do anything with the back of the neck and the occiput yet. But, oh, look at you. You know the confidence that she's got standing it's right, there. It's right. Look at that. Look at the confidence. Yeah. You can see it immediately. She's not terrified to close her eyes. Right. And by the way, um, when you get a patient who's positive for that kind of stuff that we just showed with those cerebral tests, tell them, I'm sorry, you're restricted, you are not to go up on high places, no ladders. Don't even get up on anything in reach. Don't do that. Your balance is off. You gotta tell them. They'll know it, but they'll forget it. So you gotta restrict it. Okay. So, okay. so cool. So she's started. And it's percolating. And that process is happening in a few minutes. That'll all be coming together. We'll find other things on her that we'll need to go to and fix. Now there's an interesting metallic taste that's coming out from the Is that right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Did we do laser detoxification of heavy metals just now? No what do heavy metals do to the uh, nervous system? Highly toxic. And doctors, you didn't hurt yourselves. You're not uh, hurting your carpal tunnel by going into those wonderful positions that we have to go into, even doing a grastic move, the things we have to do to our own wrists. I saw a, a fellow chiropractor with almost complete hypertrophy, um, hy not hypertrophy, uh, loss of denervation of the stenar eminence. But he wasn't doing it with the, this kind of adjusting. He was doing it with best, holding his hands in a position. Massage therapist, you want to lengthen? You want to lengthen your career and profession? You need to do laser therapy, guys. Spare yourself. Heal your patients instantly. It's wonderful. It's such a phenomenal gift. I'm going to show you how phenomenal a gift it is. This is what the Russians think of laser therapy. Let me show you. <coughs> I just thought this was incredible. Uh, where am I? While you're looking at that, I'm thinking that. Um, with Madison here, so if you went back into the back of her skull, we just going to start working on cerebral involvement, is that correct? Yeah, we've got more to do with medicine. Okay. <laughs> we should do. Yeah. Would we do, we do all that today? I would. In one, in one session, I would. Yes. But right now, we just want to go through the test. But here, look, I want you to get a close-up on this fabulous piece of literature. This is fresh off the press from Russia. This is an image of the Sistine Chapel, of course. And look at how they think in terms of laser therapy. Mm -hmm. That's what they think of. Look, you know, this is the energy that God used. It was light, you know, in the beginning, let there be light. So they're, they, they really appreciate what laser therapy is about. And there's some really interesting things. I've summarized a lot of that in this presentation, but there are some very interesting studies. Um, a lot of it is not translated, but we have little synopsis. And that is the headache in laser therapy. Because when you try to get your hands on this research, A, it's going to be in another language, uh, B, all you're going to be able to get is the abstract, and then you're not going to know, well, wow, they did this, but how? Because it's not written out. Okay, so you're constantly having to invent, invent, invent. 
All you know is, oh my God, it's got the potential that if I can get blood out of the body, irradiated, put it back in, I can help my patient with diabetes. How can I improvise that in this country? We're so limited, you know. Uh, even in car you know, you know, technically, we're not supposed to be examined orifices as chiropractors. Mm -hmm. so. You know, go to Oregon and you can deliver babies and do minor surgery. So you have so many restrictions that, that you have to work with. So. But here you go. I showed you how to do that uh, test and get the tongue out without using a depressor. You're not going into the body. Did we break any Georgia laws? No, thank you very much. Okay, there you go. Now, let's go ahead. I want you all practicing that for a few minutes. And uh, please uh, buddy up. And I want you to do, and pay attention to what I said. You might need three people to do it. You need to do this, you need to practice it, because I want you to look for how people compensate, okay? You'll find positives, but I want you to see how people compensate. A schizophrenic patient, when you ask them to do this, you know what they're going to do? It'll blow you away the first time you see it. They're not going to do this, they're going to do... They're not even going to think of doing that motion. And boy, the drugs that they put those guys on, okay? So you'll see lots of different things. It's very, very interesting. And please reinforce, no, this is not a brain tumor.